Hey guys, David Robinson here. Welcome to the Lead Sponsor Podcast. Today, I've got Tom Staub with me. Tom is the CEO of Red Oak Development Group based out of Austin, Texas. And uh, they focus on land development, mixed use development, and single family development in the Austin, Texas market. And he's also done some projects uh, outside of Austin in the Flagstaff, Arizona market. Uh, they've had uh, they've completed a total of eight projects worth 450 million, and their projects today are focused on uh, using a strong towns concept, which we go into detail and talk about what that concept uh, concept is and how they're bringing this new type of community to the Austin MSA. So I really enjoyed my conversation with Tom today, and hope you will as well. Without further ado, Tom Stubb. All right, Tom Stubb, welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, how's it going? Doing great. Doing great. Uh, it's uh, yesterday I got out. Uh, I, I'm here in Utah, and yesterday got up in into the mountains and skied Park City. So. Uh, can't complain. I'm a little sore. It was my first outing of the year, a little sore, but yeah, it was, it was a great outing. So we've had some yeah, good snow so far. I'm jealous. I'm here in uh, Cabo for, a for annual investor event. So yeah, you're, so you're, oh, yeah, you're enjoying a little bit warmer weather than what I've got here in, in Utah. Yeah. Well, good. Well, look, I'm, I'm excited to have you on the show and get into our conversation. Um, if you don't mind, let's start and just talk about, uh, get a broad overview of what your business looks like today and how your business is structured and what you guys are focused on. Yeah, so not to delve too much into the journey, but Red Oak Development Group uh, hasn't really existed under its current name. It's really a 12-year company that started in the flip game back in 2010 after the crash. Went to the syndication model of multifamily in 2014, 2016, um, in a variety of states. Pivoted in 2017 to, to land development, right? Um, we got our, our feet wet in Arizona in 18, really, and then moved over to Texas in 2020, where we are now, if not the, one of the biggest developers in South Austin, um, primarily focused in a county called Cal Caldwell County. 80% um, of our portfolio is in Texas. And... Uh, we, you know, we're, we're growing on in employee counts. We have, a our main headquarters in, in Austin. Uh, we do own our own civil engineering firm. So we have an engineering side of all this, both design on the horizontal and vertical. And then we were primarily a residential developer with a little bit of play in the commercial side. That's great. And so, um, just from a corporate structure. Um, do you have any other partners or key, uh, key principals in the company or, uh, uh, anybody else that's sort of helping you to run, uh, Red Oak development group? Oh yeah. So, I mean, I'd be lying to you if I said this is all my, my, my doing. So, um, you know, so Red Oak is owned by me hundred percent, right? Okay. Now each of our projects depending on the, the main equity player that comes in, they get a portion of the ownership model of their principal as well, more in a limited capacity, but still principal. Um, our engineering firm, it's an ownership model. So it's basically a pool of shares that are shared, that are shared among the employees. So it's, hmm. and that was really intentional to, you know, that, that, that's very much what Tesla has done too, right? Is that they, they put the ownership to the employee and that helps dictate sort of the path of the company. So Red Oak is owned by me. Each of the projects will have a variety of principles, and then the engineering firm is a unique sort of model. Gotcha. And so the engineering firm is a completely separate company, but it's integrated into Red Oak development, correct? 100%. Yeah, I mean, if you look at development, right, there's there's a number of chunks in risk, if you will. Uh, one of the big ones, um, I attribute about a third of the risk in engineering. It's also very expensive. And so when we saw... You know, I won't say the names of the companies, but we saw their prices at three thousand dollars per lot. These engineers were making, you know, about half of half of as much as what the 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 GPs are making, right? So we we brought it in the house. Uh, we now have twenty two employees and growing fast. Um, so yeah, so there's engineering is one third of the risk. Obviously, construction is a big third, and then the other third is more external variables. That meaning 
political risk, uh, market conditions, interest rates, and kind of capital. So that's that's how I see the the uh, the the world of development. And so to control a third right away is a huge advantage over every other operator. And did you have a background? And and we'll we'll dive into your full background. But I'm just curious if you had any type of background in civil engineering, or if you went out and bought another company and brought it in, or if you just partnered. Yeah, with- you know. You know, funny story, right? Um, they say, I think it's like 85 or 90% or of the time, you end up like a parent in some capacity of like what you do. You know, I grew up um, pure finance guy, Morgan Stanley, you know, um, consulting, all that. My dad was this construction architect, engineer guy, you know, kind of rough around the edges. My mom was like a salesperson. Um, and I, I never thought, I was like, oh, there's no chance I'll be in engineering, right? And then fast forward to the day when I was 40 and here I am running an engineering firm. So <laughs> it's pretty amazing how that all works. Um, and not only top of that, we're, we're, we're looking to bring in some of the construction in-house as well. So I'm literally doing my dad like life all over again, which is scary in some ways, as you can imagine. So um, no, my, my background is primarily in finance, sort of the capital markets. Got it. And you mentioned I w- that was going to be my next question was in regards to the construction side, the other, you know, one of the third, uh, as far as the risk is concerned in your business. But um, what's, uh, so at, up to this point, you've outsourced the construction to third parties, but it sounds like you're, uh, you know, in the process of potentially bringing it in-house. Yeah. So I'll, um, I'll tell you, you know, a true story on my second syndication that I did um, in Cleveland, Ohio. For any of you that are out in Cleveland, I think you can resonate with this. Um, we we had a team, I think my team fired 80 people over a course of 12 months, all right? Um, the, the subs, if you find a good sub out there, that, that's phenomenal. You absolutely treat them like kings or queens, if there's a, that exists. Um, and I, the, I'll i tell you, with this one project, it was called the Johnson, you know, smaller, smaller 1904 build, brick building, uh, 20 odd units and I'm, you know, I consider myself being able to handle a lot of stress quite well in these projects. Uh, it was a day where I think I had a, 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 a nervous breakdown, I think, because I basically <laughs> became paralyzed. I, I, I couldn't move. My body was still, I heard all the noise in the background and I just, I always became like a hundred percent apathetic, mm-hmm. but I think of what a nervous breakdown is. Um, and it was all because of sub management. Right. And the first one in Alabama was much better. The one in Cleveland, we, we got done, we made our money, we made a you know, solid exit, but that was the point I would, and by the way, I was doing some of the tile work. I was, um, I pulled like my back out moving tile. I was doing the sheet rock work. I mean, there was a lot of things I was way too involved. And so I made a promise that I would never go back to managing subs again. And so we still outsourced to third parties our sub management. However, there's a lot of layers in that process, right? There's obviously the subs. There's the foreman, there's superintendents. And so we layer on top of the superintendents, our own project management, right? So I'm still a few layers away from the subs. Got it. Yeah, I can imagine the challenges. We've done a deal out in uh, Northeast Cleveland, and uh, I can say that, uh, yeah, finding good labor uh, in Cleveland yep. is a challenge. That's for sure. Well, uh, I appreciate the overview. Um, is there anything else that you feel like we should know about how your business is structured and what you focus on today as it is today? Yeah, so we just got back from an offsite. Um, I do an annual company offsite. This year was in Dallas. And, um, you know, so after my, my world in finance, I went to a Fortune 5 company, did some negotiating there and whatnot, more on the contract side. Um, and then I went into tech for about 10 years in, in Silicon Valley. And I've had the, 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 the benefit of learning a variety of ways of each kind of these industries operate. Tech is very KPI metric based at, at the C-suite level. And so if you talk to my engineers and you talk to my team at Red Oak, you'll find that our, our company is very much run like, like a tech company, not so much in the 20 hour work weeks but very much in the, everything is based on KPIs, metrics. And there's a great book called Traction for anyone who's growing a business by uh, uh, Gino Gino or Dino. There you go, yeah. And so there's a free survey that you can have your your company do that measures your traction score. And so we are maniacal about this. And, um, 
you know, we're always aiming to be at that top score and we are today. And so we, we run our company very much, um, in this metric based way. And at the offsite in Dallas, I was, you know, I was sitting back, letting all, all my leaders present. And I realized that we essentially run our business like a pure tactician. Everything is a science. And there's some art to all this, but, um, if you ever get the chance to work with Red Oak, you'll see that we are, we are mad scientists behind the scenes. So I've got to ask then, um, as, as it relates to those KPIs at a very high level, what are the key KPIs that you're looking at on a regular basis for your business? Yeah. So, you know, it's a great question. Um, each function has their own unique KPIs, right? And obviously there's a triangle or a pyramid about six to eight months ago, all the leaders and I sat down and, and actually thought about what we're building. You know, what are we trying to build? What are the values that really mean the most to us? And we came to the conclusion that it, there wasn't anything really monetary or any sort of metric based core value. A lot of it's about how we impact the community, um, the kind of products that we're doing, you know, can we be proud of what we're doing? Um, you know, how we treat each other. And so it's, it's more qualitative, um, in terms of that. So, but in doing so, as we begin to develop KPIs, those KPIs still need to support those core values. And so, um, each of them are, are, are far different. Now I will tell you for an easy one, we have a land team, um, uh, that's part of the Red Oak company where we go out and try to find land for our projects, uh, small team, six people, right? Uh, one of the KPIs is our VAs make, uh, 18,000 calls per quarter. <laughs> yeah, we. And we're, and we're beating that number, um, each quarter as well. Uh, from now we have 180 leads from now we have three contracts and from that we, we take that one deal, right? So that's the simple flow of our KPIs of this one simple function of recovery. Yeah. That's a great example. Thanks for breaking that down for us. Well, uh, you've touched on bits and pieces of your journey to where you're at today, but let's maybe dive a little bit deeper in that. So you, you started out in the finance world and you moved into tech. Uh, let's pick up that story and talk about the progression to get to where you're at today as you sort of pushed into the real estate world. Yeah. Um, hate to, you know, hate to use a cliche accidental landlord, but, uh, a friend of mine now, Marco Fittorelli, uh, from Nerada, um, great guy, by the way, he back in 20 or 2009, I was living in the Bay area way back then. And, you know, kind of a starving college kid, had a ton of school debt, um, and I really couldn't afford much. So I had a little bit of money saved. And back then to save like $20,000 for me, was, you know, took a year and a half, you know? Um, and that was not enough to buy a home. So I said, well, I'm not going to sell this cash. And that, that I started bought, buying the rentals kind of through, uh, through Marco. And, um, but what, what the, what's interesting is I fast forward to, you know, to today and I think it's about last year or so I had this epiphany that. You know, I look at my life in the finance world. And I look at my life and all the legalese and the contracts I had to negotiate. I look at my life in the real estate, you know, the engineering. And it, it, it's, it's kind of all come to this, 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 uh, not precipice because that's a falling, but, um, it's this point of, you know, like almost this apex. And it's, it seems like all the skill sets that I've learned over the, over my years have really tailored me towards a, a, a world end development. And I, you know, it, it's really, sparked my interest in knowing from other entrepreneurs if they feel the same way, that all their life experiences kind of met at the center point. And if they, if they're succeeding, I, I assume they've, it's kind of shaped them to be the most successful version of themselves today. So my journey has been all over the place and somewhat in the business world, but it's kind of come to the center point that makes complete sense now. And I'm the most fulfilled in my entire life doing what I'm doing today. Love it. So you, we're in tech for 10 years. And then you alluded to the fact that you got into, you know, single family, just investing. Talk to us about just that first entry point into like, uh, investing in real estate or developing real estate as a business, uh, rather than just sort of on the side as a, as a hobby or, or trying to find ways yeah. to, you know, place your money somewhere. Yeah. I, I had a conversation several years ago with this, uh, I guess multi-billionaire, but you know, two or 3 billion, I guess it's a lot of money regardless. <laughs> and he said, you know, at a certain point it becomes less about return on investment and more about return on headaches. Right. 
Uh, and that really stuck with me, um, obviously, as I'm saying it now. And so, you know, I, I accumulated probably 34 or 36 properties over the course of six, seven years. And, you know, I had my number. It was about 50 to 60 doors that I would need to kind of have is a this, possible life. Is this while you're still in the tech world? Yeah, right. Okay. Yes. I was trying to yeah. scale up the little portfolio. Um, and for anyone out there that has rental properties, you, you could probably resonate with this. It's, there aren't a lot of headaches, but when there are headaches, they're kind of painful. And, you know, it, one eviction really, really hurts for about two to four weeks, right, uh, in, in terms of headaches. And so I started putting that, that, that mindset of, well, even before I was told this, but the return on headaches. And to me, owning rental properties, if you get the right tenant, it's fantastic, but that's like one out of four times. Um, it just isn't worth the headaches. Now, they're great long-term assets. They definitely... Um, you know, help you accumulate wealth. They're, they're phenomenal for mortgage pay down, return on equity, yada, yada. But I pivoted out of that back in 2019, 2020. And I began to sell most of my properties that were somewhat headache with me. You know, and I still own a, you know, a handful here and there. But what I've been switching to is more of the, uh, the more passive, you know, investments. Mm. that being note, uh, note investing. So, you know, selling off lots of seller financing selling off homes as seller financing and essentially removing all the headaches and just focusing on the cash flow, even if your return on investments, eight, nine, 10% versus the 14 to 16, that, that spread is just not worth all the headaches. And so I've really been pushing over the last five to seven years to build a portfolio of more passive investments and, and, and truly passive with as few headaches as possible. And so uh, then I, I'm going to assume then that your development projects are build to sell. Uh, these aren't build to rent projects. Uh, so your model is, hey, we have this business that is going to generate cash that then I can go and deploy in cash flowing assets that have a focus on least headache possible. Is that a, a brief synopsis well, yeah. or synopsis of your model? More or less. Yeah. So we, um, in that portfolio of all our projects, I would say about 20 to 30% of them are purely cash flow projects. Like for example, we're, we're building the biggest RV park in Austin, right? Oh God. 500 RV slots. Yeah. Self-storage, you know, right next to the biggest Bucky's in the world. So, um, Bucky's by the way is like this cult following Walmart. Uh, it, it is pretty impressive. Um, they're also mad scientists in their operation, but anyways, um, so that's a pure cash flow business, right? That'll, that'll grow or net, you know, 120, 140 a month. Funny. Um, we had the seller financing deals of lots again. Talking about portfolio, we're aiming to get about 500 in the next four years. Um, those produce 1200 to $1,500 per lot in cash flow um, per month. Yeah. Mm. Um, so there's that. Um, and then we have, uh, obviously, our, our uh, we have a few resorts that we're, that we're building, so smaller kind of operations. Um, so there's cash flows there. And then uh, we are building structures, um, multifamily up in the North Austin and then we'll slowly do that as it makes sense. So we are slowly developing cash flowing assets. But yes, you're 100 percent correct. I call that um, the wealth, wealth accumulation flywheel. Mm -hmm. You you make these windfalls, you reinvest in passive income assets, and then that kind of compounds over time. And so um, as it relates to go back to sort of your focus today and your business today, um, you have, and we'll talk about one particular project here in a bit, uh, 700 acres in uh, Lockhart, Texas. Um, but if you could describe for us your ideal project today, it sounds like you have a wide variety of focus from a development standpoint, from RV to single family uh, and, and other what would you say is your ideal project today where your business is at today? Yeah. So I will say I'll caveat this with, with a few things. I, I've, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and the, especially a developer, there's always a deal flying across your desk. Right. Um, and I call it the entrepreneurial, uh, uh poison, which is having too many irons in the fire. So I've, and even, even still, I still have these one off, you know, RV parks. Right. But if I'm going to do, some unique project like that, the margins have to be so substantial that the chance of failure is very minimal, right? And that is the RV park, that is CZ Resorts that we have. So, but generally, I still want to keep a very narrow focus. If if I had to pick one favorite type of asset that I that I found, I it's also kind of by accident. Um, it's these lot 
financing deals. They're phenomenal, right? So essentially, you find the old I'll give everyone a little little nugget here. You find pieces of land that are essentially like rectangle, okay? And they're they 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 have one long side of road frontage, usually over a thousand linear feet. And you know they're in the twenty to fifty acre range. And what you do is you get entitlements done, and there has to be water and power and by the site. And then what you do is you essentially run the water line down in front of the property, the power line down in front of the property, and let and, and then subdivide each of the lots into one to two acre lots. You sell them off at least in Texas for the one twenty to two hundred thousand dollar range. You require the buyers put up twenty percent. You you carry a note at twelve percent. Um, and generally your, your exit base is about two to a half, three times what you paid for the land. Hmm. So your ROI ends up being like a 25 to 35% return on your initial amount uh, capital invested. So, and these are as headache free as it gets because it's just dirt. So if they default, you get the dirt right back. There's no house, there's no taxes, there's no maintenance, there's no, none of that. Um, and people tend to sit on dirt for a long time. So. These have been my favorite asset type, and if I could scale these up to you know a million lots, I absolutely would. And so that seems like a strategy that comes if you're talking about this flywheel, right? You're you're taking the the revenue generated from the development business and going and placing it into this, these these uh, you know the yeah. lot finance deals. Um, as it relates to Red Oak, and if if I was an investor that was interested in investing with Red Oak in one of your projects, what would you be pitching me on as far as like, what is your core competency? Like, what are you focused on moving forward and what would I be investing in? You know, yeah, it's, you know, it's a good question. If you go to like CrowdStreet or uh, Peer, Peer Street or whatever it is, you know, there's just like these eight to 10% preps and, you know, you, you have no idea who the hell the operator is. I actually almost, when I get on a call with someone, I'm I'm trying to figure out why why they shouldn't invest in my deal, mm. which is kind of kind of intuitive because ultimately, you know, three years down the road, I don't want them to say, hey, I need my capital back, or uh, you know, this isn't working out, and then I had to have a capital event. Um, what I have found from most of my investors is I is I try to figure out is this going to be a long term partnership? Because I tell you what, as you probably know, if you have one successful exit they start flowing in more money to your deals. I mean, I have investors from 2016 that are still my investors that have almost two thirds of their wealth with me, which is crazy. Makes me nervous. Right. Um, and that's because of a proven track record and that trust. Uh, I mean, I, I have investors now where I text them and say, Hey, we have an upcoming deal. Here's a bit of parameters. What do you think? Five minutes later, later they'll say I'm in like, it's, it's that seamless now because of the success. Right. But, you know, I had to disqualify a lot of investors that kind of want quick wins or they have, or they're, they're, they're too finicky on their, on their, on their deals. So I'm actually looking to disqualify them up front as well as they're trying to do the same for me. And so when I look at partners, you know, I do talk about tax sheltering. That, that's a big focus of ours that we try to bring um, to everyone. So if you're an investor, yes, you get a chance to make, you know, whatever the, the returns are, 16 to 25 percent annually, depending. Um, but we also want you to have the same mindset. You know, so come to our event to talk about deferred sales trust and how we sh shelter the taxes there. Talk about, you know, planning. So like, for example, this is December and we have an exit happening in Arizona. So some of the investors are coming to our, our event in Cabo and we're going to be talking about, well, what if we recognize the profits on Jan 1 versus in December? You know, what are your gains this year and do you have losses to offset these gains? If not, let's push it out three weeks, right? And so if an investor is willing to have those conversations, and be strategic, then that's the right kind of investor for us. Um, it, there's always an investor who's supposed to give us the money and, you know, sit back. That's fine too. But we're trying to avoid the investor who has, you know, sort of crypto hopes, mm. you know, or that sort of finicky mindset. Yeah. Understood. I've got to go back. I'm curious. You, you mentioned this metric of 18,000 calls from your VAs. What are they calling on? What are they trying to hunt yeah. down for your business? Geez, like so you're gonna see the obsession I have here real quick. So um I've tried you know, nothing wrong with any of this here. I've I've tried callers from the Philippines, but India, I've I've worked with people from the Ukraine, from Brazil, I mean all over the world, right? Um I will say there's something to the American work work ethic, number one. Um, but then taking even closer, 
within America, when, when we began to hire VAs from, let's say, New York or Jersey or maybe Washington versus Tennessee, Texas, what? So basically, we first wanted to know, okay, well, who are we calling? Well, we're calling farmers, okay? And then we started measuring, okay, um, and this got really, really nerdy fast, but how many times is it a male versus a female answering the phone? And we found out that seven out of eight times, that's a male. That's a male farmer, okay? Okay, great. Well, and they're from Texas. So then we, we actually switched our VAs and we, <laughs> we hired um, three Southern Bell women with, with a little bit of twang in their voice. And our conversion rates tripled. Mm. Okay. So, um, you know, and again, we paid them a little more than I paid what we, we could pay in the Philippines. But our conversion rates are, I guarantee you, probably five to 10 times higher than anyone else doing this. Right. And so we get these, you know, sweet talking Southern Bells on there, talking to Farmer Joe's. And let's be honest, you know, how that works. So things are opening up. They start revealing what they want to pay for or sell for the land. Um, and then that's how we get kind of the best of the best deals in the market. And so what what are they targeting? Uh, just general land? I mean, at any location, any any no, like, yeah, they have a zoning. What what are they what are they focused on yeah. trying to find for you? Yeah, so it has to be near an urban core. We have sort of a sweet spot of acreage around forty acres, mm. um, no floodplain or very minimal floodplain. We have that algorithm all built out. So we we pull a list of leads, we 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 have our engineering team down select them to a small subset, and then we go out and, uh, and and talk to the to the farmers. Once we understand, okay, are are these good leads? And again, our conversion rate is one percent of all the calls. So, and and our VAs make two hundred calls per day. Mm. Okay, so we get two leads roughly, uh, roughly per VA per day, um, and we and we down select those um, depending on the type of land where it's at. Is it the right shape? Um, is there enough access point? What's the zoning? How far away is water, sewer, power, all of that? And then we have an understanding of the comps of the market. We go back to the farmer and then we negotiate to ensure that we have a spread. Um, and then if they say yes, then we have a deal. Love it. Well, let's uh, shift gears here slightly and let's talk about a particular deal. Um, you uh, have acquired 700 acres in Lockhart, Texas. Forty million dollars in acquisition on the dirt, uh, with an estimated exit valuation of you know two to three billion by twenty uh, twenty twenty three. Um, let's uh, let's back up. Let's talk about that. Um, how did you source that opportunity, and how have you at this point in time financed that opportunity and structured the deal? Yeah, so just, just a few uh, pieces of clarity there. So we Please. have been acquiring the dirt. For the last two years, mm. um, the exit valuation includes all vertical, and that would be probably by twenty thirty five to twenty forty. So this is a long, you know, fifteen year, twenty year project. Um, we were one of the first movers to Lockhart, and for you all out there that don't know where that is, that's thirty minutes south of Austin, about thirty minutes. It's the barbecue capital of Texas, and they would tell you it's the barbecue ca capital of the world. Um, and, and and they do have some phenomenal barbecue, um, I guess, cooks down there. Uh, they have an event every month, like fifty four barbecue players in the world. So they're, they're definitely top notch for barbecue. Anyway, it's a town of 15,000 people. Uh, this community is now 700 acres. It was a thousand that we had a, a deal gone bad just because of seller, you know, desires on price. Uh, we're still going to build a community that will probably produce 10,000 people. Okay. Um, and you know, when, when, when you do a project that's 10 years long, you can't have just land that you purchase with capital. Unless you're a big group out of Wall Street that can land bank, you have to be kind of crafty when you're negotiating. So um, of the 700 acres, about 400 of these acres are in the form of a joint venture, meaning the landowner came to us and said, hey, at no cost, I'll give you this land, but I need to make more money on the exit than I would today. And so we've negotiated uh, a big chunk of this uh, one being free, but we'll pay back towards the the, mm. the phases seven, eight, and nine of the deal. Right, so that ten phase deal, we've we've negotiated with the the landowners to pay them more money in the later phases. Okay, so what that ends up doing is it allows us to focus on the first three or four phases. Those capital events pay off the debt, pay off the equity, and so then we're free and clear by by really the fourth or fifth year of the project. Okay, so. You know, it's a, it's a beast. I mean, um, it, 
the calculus involved in a 10 phase project of the size and magnitude is uh, you have to be as precise as possible, at least through the first three to four years. Uh, Cause it is a lot about cash for cash flow, capital events and paying off that high cost debt and equity. And uh, just to go touch on uh, sourcing the opportunity from the very beginning, yeah. do you remember, I mean, I'm, uh, you've got VAs that are calling, yeah. you know, making 18,000 calls per year, but do you remember how this one was sourced? I do. Yeah. So um, a few agents for sure are, are so it's a combination, right? Um, a few agents, a few um, of our own kind of efforts. And then a partner of mine gave us the first 90 acres uh, to start with. Um, and I'll plug the agents. Her name's Kaylee Sutton. Um, she's been pretty, I actually, she'll be here to the, this week in Cabo as well, but she's, she's one of my main sorcery, um, people for the Lockhart area. So, so this wasn't, about, this wasn't, this wasn't sourced from one owner. Uh, this was no. Yeah. Okay. She's probably five or six owners. Um, you know, and, and, and oftentimes land has a family because People who are wealthy end up buying land for their family, legacy wealth, and then you have four or five sisters and brothers that have to sign the documents, which is a pain in the butt. So that's, that's, we probably, if you include it that way, we have essentially 10 signers that had to sign on all these tracks for us mm-hmm. to take down. And by the way, we have two of these communities in, in this area. So it's, it's um, similar structure, JV agreement with part of the land. Uh, we take down a piece of it up front and then we just, we work to create those capital events along the way. Yeah, I love it. So uh, what are the biggest challenges that you face in the development world in the market that we're in today? Yeah, great question. Um, well, one, not not even as it relates to today's market, but you know, with any business, scaling up is, is tough, right, for anyone. And I think the, the best developers know how to scale up with the right people on the team. You, I think in the next six to 12 months, you're going to find a lot of developers um, defaulting because they, they haven't figured out how to be lean, yet scale up, um, and, and handle these kind of sizes of, of projects. Uh, capital was easy eight months ago to get, and it's definitely drying up. And so I think, you know, we have a couple of deals that are coming to market in early 2024, thank God, not 23. Um, but I, I do think if you're delivering products next year, you're in a tough spot. For sure, mm-hmm. and if you haven't had to re- renegotiate your, your your terms, good for you. Um, but I would definitely be expecting some sort of renegotiation um, in the next six to eight months. So, so this particular, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Please, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no, so I think you know, challenge wise, I you know, I think everyone can probably agree with this is that it's the uh, it's the capital markets that is still out there. Um, it's slightly more expensive. It's less levered, but generally debt is a little harder to get. And then capital equity on the equity side is just spooked right now, right? And if, even if you tell them, hey, 2020, 2024, 25, we'll be out of this recession, that's when we're bringing all, all the loss to the market, they still want to play it safe and hold cash. And uh, what's the end product with this particular project in Lockhart? Uh, residential subject? Yeah, so uh, it's a mixed use. So, um, my head engineer, Luke Carraway, who came from Kimberly Horn, visionary guy. Um, if any of you are curious about what we're doing, check out uh, this this concept called Strong Towns. It's by a guy named Chuck Marone. So essentially, it's this idea of a community that requires no cars. It's all bikeable, walkable, um, and it can be re- you know redeveloped over 20, 30 years. So for example, um, the zoning is pretty unique in that, uh, for simple terms, we're going to have affordable housing maybe in phase one, we're going to have move up in phase two. We're going to have luxury in phase four. We'll have multifamilies, um, and, and, and you know, we'll have school in the community, retail, medical offices. And so the first concept is that you don't have to go anywhere besides this community, right? Two, you can buy a house in your twenties and then move up into your thirties with the family. And then as you become in your forties with more wealth, fifties, there's toll rollers are down the street for luxury. Right. So it's, it's really hitting every class of people and it's, it's hitting every stage of life. And so the, these communities are not just one type of home, what you usually see in, in communities, but it's going to be a variety of price points, product types, um, and even lifestyle. That's an interesting concept. Um, have there been, is this your first project that would have that concept, the, the strong town concept? 
and uh, yeah. have there been other projects that have been done uh, that you're using as a model? So there's one in Michigan. Um, again, strong talent is not not too new to the world, but you know, um, people try to do versions of it in a diluted way, right? Uh, this is a pretty pure format of what that is. Um, I've done other mixed use projects for more just, you know, 300 lots, a single family, multifamily, and some small commercial, you know, and, and the, the lacking piece has been the integration of the walkability of, you know, I mean, for, for example, we're looking at community farms, right? So within everyone within 200 feet will have some community farm around their home, which allows the community to farm, take the, the vegetables and fruits from the farms to their house. Just that alone already creates that sense of community, right? Our our city center, which both the communities will have, um, will feature this sort of think, think of it like a like a pop up micro retail, right? For a two hundred to eight hundred square feet um, micro retail. Well, that allows people who have a, a dream to start a business to have a very low cost of entry. You know, if you look at any business owner that has to open up a restaurant, for example, I'm talking about you know a quarter million dollars in capital outlay. Well, now you got a pop-up shop that's 200 square feet. Maybe you got to spend 20K to get started. That's very palatable. And also, the chance of success is much higher for these business owners. So, you know, and again, what does that do for community? Well, maybe you want to have a part-time business on, on, on the weekend. And now you can down the street from your house. So th there's a lot of these nuances that are going to drive that feeling of community. And it's really around the concept of strong towns. Hmm. Interesting. So <clears throat> on this particular project, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing today on this project? Um, I won't, <laughs> I won't say his name, but so this is, as we all know, I said a third of the, the, the risk equation is, is the politics. We're heavily entrenched in all sorts of le levels of the uh, state of Texas. Um, we have lobbyists, we have past senators on our bench. Um, we, we, we talk to the judges, the county commissioners, the mayor, chamber of commerce, superintendents. Um, there is one fellow that, was a bit reluctant um, when he when we first showed him this concept. He said, "You know, we don't much like change here." <laughs> so now we, you know, he's in his seventies. Um, we we've gotten to come around to the idea, and now he was he called us on Thanksgiving to wish us a happy Thanksgiving. So he's he's starting to open up on the you know on on what we're trying to do here. But um, that's been the biggest challenge. We'll know in January. There's a there's something called a mud. If we get the mud, we're full steam ahead. And this mud is essentially a, a way to get reimbursed through your your um, improvements and the utilities that we do. So um, if we get that full steam ahead, if not, then we have another community that will do the exact same concept too. Interesting. Well, um, I've enjoyed our conversation thus far. I want to start winding down and be respectful of your time, but I've got a few final questions for you. Um, sure. Considering where we're at in the market today, I know you don't have a crystal ball. All my guests say they don't have one. I'm waiting for the one person that actually comes out and says they do have it. But uh, not having your crystal ball on you, what's your prediction for the real estate market over the next 12 months? Yeah, you know, it depends on which market, right? Um, but keeping it short and simple, the ones that boom the fastest will revert back to the mean as money supply is sucked out. Um, we're going to have a tough 2023. I think inventory is going to peak at nine to 10 months, come back down. Um, and I think we'll be rebounding in mid to late 2024. So it'll be a strong 2025. If you were to start from scratch today, having all the knowledge and experience that you have, but your business goes to zero, you have to start over. What would you do and why? In my 20s, I hated to network. Um, in my 30s, it was essential. In my 40s, that, that, that's all, all I'll do. So I would say if you had nothing, it's it's four hours to get a latte. So I would get out there and network nonstop. So, and, and that matters because if you have an idea and you have a way to operate, um, you'll find someone that has some money that will want to work, work with, with you. And if you had to say what type of business you would get involved with or start, uh, what area of business would that be? For me, this one, uh, I would do land development. Love it. There's a lot of sponsors out there that 
uh, want to grow, have visions of growing and building a substantial firm or company, but they may struggle. Not everybody grows at the same pace and at the same level and to the same level. What's different about you compared to other sponsors out there who are wanting to go down the same path that you've gone down? Um, well, one, I think many sponsors are paper profit focused and that's all they care about, right? They focus on the money, the money, the money on paper, and it, that's not very fulfilling. So, um, I am obsessed with what I do. I work every day and I enjoy it. So, uh, one, become obsessed with whatever you do, but also hire the right people. Get some people on your team that can really elevate what you're doing. And an easy way to do this, um, think about your day to day, figure out what you're doing day to day that's repetitive in the same process. That's usually a chunk that you, you can hire someone for. That leads me to my next question, which is, uh, aside from your role in the company, what's the most critical role for the success of your business today? Um, I would say more of a function and that collective function is, um, either operations management or project management. And that can be through engineering, that can be through capital markets, that can be through our projects, basically having leaders in place to ensure the rating timelines and what we promise to build debt, equity players, our builders, our employees. And so managing, uh, the operations. Last question for you. If there is a particular strategy or tactic that you're deploying in your business today that's working exceptionally well, what is it? Yeah, so in land, we are, I, I'll give you a few nuggets. One, we are renegotiating all contracts. Uh, we're pushing out closing dates for nine to 12 months. Two, we're asking for seller financing on all of our deals at very low debt costs, five, six percent. Uh, leverage of 80, 85%, um, that, and then I also have my underwriting process is very conservative. So you have to make money in a crash scenario. All of our deals make money in a 20% crash. And so if we do crash, we, we, we're so profitable that will allow you to sleep at night. So, you know, just, and on that note, I would sum it up by saying you, you don't have to take on risky deals. There are plenty of deals out there that have decent margins that they're not grand slams, but, but they're not singles. So. Love it. Well, Tom, this has been a great conversation. Thanks for, you know, sharing your journey with us, telling us uh, about your business and giving some insight into the development world and talking about this, uh, this project, uh, this strong town project, 700 acres in Lockhart, Texas. Thanks for going into some detail about that. Before I let you go, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you and learn more about what you have going on? Yeah. Our, our website, uh, Red Oak BC, like Victor Charlie, dot com. Love it. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. So if you've enjoyed the conversation we've had with Tom today, go down to the show notes right now, click on that link to connect with Tom and his team. Again, Tom, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing your journey with us. And I look forward to staying in touch with you down the road. Sure. Thank you.